Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to the launch of a new worldwide initiative, which is taken on Antibiotic Innovation Challenge. My name is Astrid Frohloff. I have the pleasure to moderate this event. Today, we are taking an important step in addressing the challenge of antimicrobial resistance. Since many years, we are taking about the urgent need of taking action and now we are very glad to present to you a new initiative which is launched by a groundbreaking partnership. Many leading pharmaceutical companies of the world are standing firm behind this initiative. And we're happy to introduce to you here at the Berlin studio as well as online a very strong lineup of the heads of the leading pharmaceutical companies. We are happy to welcome um, as well ministers uh, from Germany, France and Denmark. We are welcoming the European Commissioner for Health, the head of the WHO, EIB, as well as the Welcome Trust and many other representatives of the health uh, sphere. So in this moment, the AMR initiative is launched simultaneously in Washington and Tokyo as well. We are looking for, forward for an inspiring debate and you are invited, of course, to put questions to us. You can put questions on chat and on chat you find also the program, the biographies of the speakers and more information. So, first of all, I would like to hand over to Thomas Kühne, the Director General of the IFPMA, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, who is indeed the driving force behind the new initiative and who is our host today. Uh, there has been a fair amount of chatter about this initiative recently, and uh, it's your turn now to uh, tell us about this initiative. What is it all about? Thank you very much, Astrid. I do believe it's an initiative health experts around the world have sort of been waiting for, because the problem is known. Uh, the problem of antimicrobial resistance has been known for years. And now with COVID-19 having impacted our lives, public health, economies, but also personal lives so much, I think it's interesting to note that COVID-19, we have passed the threshold of more than 500,000 people, lives lost because of this tragic pandemic. But already now, every year, 700,000 lives are lost. And not just in developing countries, also here in Germany, in industrialized countries, because of antimicrobial resistance. The fact that our antibiotics, the most important invention of modern medicine in the 20th century, are increasingly no longer effective. And that has been debated for at least six years since the O'Neill report was published in 2014. Uh, Chancellor Merkel brought this to the G7 in Heiligendamm in 2015. But we haven't seen action and from an industry point of view, we were increasingly also challenged. What is it that you as innovative pharmaceutical companies are doing to solve the problem? Okay, and uh, how did you manage to pull up this uh, initiative? I think it wasn't quite, quite easy. And, and now, can you describe what the fund is actually aiming for precisely? I think when you look at the dynamics, the fact of the matter is right now, the worst which can happen to somebody who invests in antibiotics is that they succeed, because then they will lose more money than when they just have to write off the research expenditure. Therefore, it is quite remarkable that 23 companies have come together. And it is remarkable in so far as the intention of the fund is not to make money. The intention is really to respond to public health needs. We have debated over the last 12 months with experts from WHO, from the European Investment Bank, Wellcome Trust and the industry and all the opinion leaders in AMR what needs to be done. And the response is a fund which does provide a lifeline, which does provide funding for clinical research where up to now there was no funding available for biotech companies, for startup companies, for SMEs. And 
we did reach critical mass. We are almost at a billion dollars just from the pharma companies. We certainly expect that we will pass that threshold. And with that, we are optimistic that with our scientific know-how, with the expertise, with the biotech companies, we should be able by the end of the decade, by 2030, to bring two to four novel antibiotics, which do provide a much needed relief. Because right now, we increasingly work with antibiotics of last resort. We increasingly run out of ammunition. And that's why this initiative is so important. Mm -hmm. And who is taking benefit uh, from this fund, actually? It's not the investors. The investors are basically multinational, innovative pharmaceutical companies. But those who will benefit are small startup companies or biotech companies who I think were quite desperately waiting for this kind of solution, for this kind of initiative. And it is, as I indicated, a public health initiative. None of the investors expects to make you know, money from it. Huge returns. What we do hope, and that's a truly important part of the initiative, is that we can trigger a debate because long term you will not, sol will not solve the problem with two to four new antibiotics. Bacteria will continue to become resistant. Therefore, we do need longer term market reforms. We do need governments to engage. But rather than us saying we wait till governments engage and then we will invest, it's really, I think, a great initiative that the industry leaders, as those you know, here with me, have accepted we have a responsibility, we are willing to run the risk that nothing will happen, but us doing it, we hope that this will truly trigger the debate which is so much needed too. One of the pharmaceutical companies which uh, invested in the fund is Böhringer Ingelheim and uh, we're glad to uh, greet this afternoon uh, uh, Hubertus von Baumbach, the chairman of the board of managing directors, Böhringer Ingelheim. Uh, Mr. von Baumbach, why did you decide to invest in this fund? Well, since its founding days, more than 130 years ago, Böhringer Ingelheim drives is based on innovation. And as a company, we feel committed to improving patients' lives. At the same time, we saw that there's a great need for new products. There is a need for innovation in the field of antimicrobial resistance. And as a company, we don't have AMR research or antimicrobial antibiotic research ourselves, but we have a lot of things that we can bring to the table around that setting of the fund. Number, number one is that we understand, uh, like many of uh, my colleagues around here, understand very well how products are being researched, how they are being developed, clinically being developed, and then brought, registered and brought to the market. So that's one of the assets that we believe can contribute to this fund. In addition to that, we've been over 10 years now running a venture fund ourselves, so we know what startups need to really be successful. Money is generic. Money can come from anywhere. Now we, as an investor in this fund, we understand the risk profile of the industry, and we know what young companies, startup companies need, and we want them to focus on research and give them the necessary support and the experience that we have for such a long time. Now, we have heard from one investor of the AMR fund. Uh, now, let's hear from others. We received short clips and uh, we want to share them with you. We will hear now from Emma Walmsley, CEO, GSK. Deborah Dantje, head of Lundbeck. Vas uh, Nara Simhan, CEO Novartis. Severin Schwan, CEO of Rush Group. And Paul Stoffels, Johnson and & Johnson. And this is what they said. GSK is delighted to be part of today's announcement that industry has come together to pledge a billion dollars of new investment to bring new antibiotics to patients, medicines which might not otherwise be developed. The coronavirus pandemic is teaching us many things, including that the world needs to be better prepared for global health threats. Antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, is just such a threat. Left untackled, it risks taking us back to a time when a simple cut could become lethal. 
At GSK, we have a proud record spanning over 70 years of researching and developing new antibiotics and vaccines to prevent infection. And we currently have 27 active R&D projects targeting priority pathogens. But we also recognise there is a systemic issue which needs to be addressed. We know the power of antibiotics to help patients, but there is limited funding available for research because the market doesn't reflect the value that antibiotics deliver to society and therefore doesn't incentivise investment. So that's why new models are required and the AMR Action Fund is a great example of that. Working together in partnership, our industry is playing a core role in tackling coronavirus. I'm very confident we can do the same in fighting AMR. The growth of antimicrobial resistance is becoming one of the 21st century's most acute healthcare crises. Drug-resistant bacteria are developing faster than new and innovative antibiotics can reach the market. If the world continues to stand idly by, we will witness antibiotic-resistant infections claim the lives of millions of people. But it's not too late to change this terrifying outlook. At Lundbeck, we're not directly active in the fields of antibiotic research, but we feel an obligation as members of the healthcare ecosystem to support action to stop this threatening development. We're so proud to be part of an industry that is stepping up and acknowledging the importance of urgent action by joining the AMR Action Fund, which pledges a total of $1 billion to bring at least two to four new antibiotics to the market and ultimately save lives. We're hoping that the launch of the AMR Action Fund is the beginning of the end of the antimicrobial crisis. We look forward to collaboration with researchers, institutions and philanthropic organizations to make this happen. We also urge policymakers to take action. We all have a role to play. Novartis is incredibly proud to be one of 20 leading pharmaceutical companies to launch a $1 billion AMR action fund to enable a new generation of antimicrobial medicines to be brought to the world. Now, as all of you know, antimicrobial resistance is an incredibly important challenge that continues to create tremendous strain for healthcare systems. Finding a new drug for a resistant bacteria has proven incredibly challenging. Our hope is with this $1 billion fund, we can catalyze new innovation in public-private partnerships with government, with biotechs, with academic labs together to bring the next wave of innovation to tackle this incredibly important global challenge. Novartis is proud of our many decades long commitment to being one of the largest producers of antibiotics in the world through our Sandoz Generics company. This is incredibly important because we enable the world to treat these infections on a day-to-day -day basis. Joining the AMR Action Fund is the next step in this long legacy that will enable us to catalyze incredibly important innovation for the future. It is a pleasure to join you today in announcing Roche's commitment to the AMR Action Fund. Although we are currently in the midst of a global crisis with COVID-19, our world faces another big challenge of drug-resistant infections or antimicrobial resistance, which threaten the very foundations of modern medicine. At the same time, antibiotics R&D faces significant market and development challenges. The private R&D business model, underpinned by sound intellectual property protection, has enabled companies to make bold investments in R&D for new products. To tackle the challenge of antimicrobial resistance, Roche is proud to be discovering and developing a pipeline of novel antibiotics that can effectively treat drug-resistant infections. We are also developing diagnostic assays which can rapidly identify the type of drug-resistant bacteria that are responsible for causing these infections. Our vision is to usher in a new age of antibiotics R&D, one that we call the Platinum Age, where new classes of antibiotics and timely personalized healthcare options will be available for patients. We also believe that it is crucially important to have a thriving antibiotics ecosystem with multiple industry players, governments, 
government agencies, private foundations and private investors joining hands together to find solutions. Breaking down our silos and bringing true innovation into our thinking will ensure that differentiated medicines are brought forward for the benefit of patients, no matter where they come from. Antimicrobial resistance is a global public health emergency. It has the potential to turn diseases that are relatively easy to treat today virtually incurable. This problem threatens developed and developing nations alike. Left unchecked, AMR could significantly eclipse the total global health challenge that the world is facing currently with COVID-19. That's why the pharmaceutical industry is taking collective action in the face of this predictable and preventable health security threat. Johnson & Johnson is proud to join with more than 20 companies to collectively invest nearly 1 billion to the AMR Action Fund. Our goal is to bring forward two to four new antibiotics by the end of the next decade. This is the largest collective venture ever created to address AMR. As a founding partner, Johnson & Johnson is committing $100 million to the fund. Our participation built on our long-term commitment to develop and, and responsibly deploy innovative technologies and treatments to combat AMR. This includes our work to tackle drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is responsible for one-third of all AMR-related deaths in the world. Let's learn a lesson from COVID-19 and be better prepared for global health challenges. Together, our industry can make a far greater impact than any single company, and we are proud to stand with our peers against the threat of antimicrobial resistance. So, thank you very much for these powerful statements. Um, I think we should talk now about the public health point of view, and I'm very happy to welcome now a lady who has been advocating globally the fight against AMR since many, many years. Uh, we're going to the UK to Dame Sally Davis. Uh, she has many, many important roles, uh, not least as a co-convener of the United Nations Interagency Coordination Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. And today she is the UK's first special envoy on AMR. Good afternoon to the UK. Good afternoon, Astrid. <laughs> Uh, Dave Sally, you have long been campaigning for action to address AMR. For what reason? Well, we know that it is natural for infective agents, bacteria, viruses, to develop resistance against the treatments we give them. But that then means people are ill for longer and the death rates higher. Indeed, we know more than 700,000 people die across the world because of resistance to the treatments they're given, including probably around 60,000 newborn babies in India every year dying of sepsis that isn't untreatable. So clearly, this cost to people's happiness, to the health system, is immense. Meanwhile, the Canadians have done a study which shows that they're already in 2018 losing at least 2 billion Canadian dollars to their economy because of the loss of workers. And the World Health, um, the World Bank, I mean, has done some great work, which is terrifically worrying that by 2050, more than 28 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty if we don't have effective anti um, microbials, antibiotics. It's because we're going to lose modern medicine. I welcome the comments made by the industry leaders that we've just been seeing, and they've made the points from Emma Walmsley talking about a scratch on the face that can actually then lead to sepsis and death. But we know that cancer treatments are based on having effective treatments for infections. Modern medicine, including cesarean sections and big surgery, are based on having effective treatments. And it's costly to get it wrong. If you look at the example of TB, we can tell you that if it is not a resistant TB, the cost is cheap. But the minute it's drug resistant, the price rises to at least $7,000, which is 20-fold more than for standard TB. And when it's extreme drug resistance, it rises to 80-fold. 
So it is a cost in suffering, a cost in time ill, and a cost to our health systems and economy that threatens modern medicine. And it's not something we should allow to happen. It's been creeping up on us. And the pandemic's shown us how fragile our ways of life are and how an unknown dangerous pathogen can turn up and really turn everything over in a matter of months. This is something that if we choose to, as this fund is going to help, we can address, but we have to work together from local to global levels, from industry to investors, governments, and the public. We've got to harness this momentum and take it forward, or more people will die and more money spent. Uh, would you say, uh, uh, Dame Sally, that this uh, new AMR fund could even be a game changer in terms of increasing investment and innovation in new antimicrobials? Well, it's about time because I think they described very beautifully the market failure we have in antibiotics. I absolutely agree. We as health systems do not pay enough for the antibiotics, the novel ones, to make it worth a profit for the companies to make them. They're too cheap, yet to research and produce, they're very expensive. We've even seen small antibiotic companies going bankrupt. Arcaogen and Melinta are, are a couple of them, and they have no apparent way of raising funds. And, you know, if we don't have things like this fund and more government funding too, we're not going to be able to continue with modern medicine. They're a global public good, and we've really got to make this happen. And the pharmaceutical industry is, after all, in a unique position to step up and make a difference. And that's what they're doing. And I'm proud to be a partner and see this happen. It's a great down payment on what needs doing. Of course, we're going to have to find ways from governments and health systems to pull through the new drugs. And we're very happy that in our UK National Action Plan for AMR, we are trying a pilot for incentivizing drug development that represents a subscription-style payment. But we're, we in the UK are a small part of the market. We need everyone to join in and try innovations, find new drugs, find better ways of paying for them. So I'm pleased at IFPMA's initiative. It's clearly going to complement other initiatives like Guard Peas, but this is an important step for the world in the right direction. Thank you for doing it. Thank you very much, Dame Sally, to the UK. Well, uh, Dame Sally has explained the public health uh, challenge. Uh, let's now see what the public health response to the AMR Action Fund is. Uh, we will hear three short comments now um, from different perspectives, and we will start with the view from the WHO. It's a great pleasure to greet now Dr. Tedros from the WHO in Geneva. Good afternoon, Dr. Tedros. What is your view on the new fund? Good afternoon. Guten Tag. <laughs> Good and it's an honor to join you all today at the launch of the AMR Action Fund. And I want to thank everybody who helped turn this idea into a reality. Thank you so much indeed. The pharmaceutical companies and foundations the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, the European Investment Bank, the Wellcome Trust, and of course, uh, my colleagues here at uh, WHO. So much gratitude for making this happen. As you know, COVID-19 has demonstrated all too well the consequences of the failure to invest in preparedness and the dramatic impact it has on all sectors. As we continue to tackle the pandemic, we must simultaneously ensure that efforts to stop the spread of antimicrobial resistance are accelerated. Uh, AMR, uh, AMR is a slow uh, tsunami uh, that threatens to undo a so century of medical progress. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Hello? Yes, we can hear you can clearly. You hear we got everything you said, Mr. Tedros. No, I, I, 
have I finished my time? I have more things to say. <laughs> no? So please go ahead, Mr. Tedros. We can hear you. We can see you. Okay, thank you. So a record number of countries are now monitoring and reporting on antibiotic resistance to WHO. And as you know, the data they provide reveals that resistance to essential medicines to treat infections continues to spread across the world at an alarming rate. And the current pipeline of new antibiotics is insufficient, with private investment shrinking and public investment unable to fuel, fully compensate. The AMR Action Fund will be key to reversing that trajectory, strengthening and accelerating the research and development of antibiotics through game-changing investments into biotechnology uh, companies around the world. Our focus must be on both priority pathogens and innovative new treatments. I want to offer WHO's full assistance in ensuring that public health access and appropriate use are at the center of the fund's vision. No one sector can tackle this challenge alone, which is why I welcome the collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry, the development banks, and philanthropic organizations. This is a new model for public-private partnership, using private sector investment to address global public health challenges with guidance <coughs> from the public sector. And of course, existing public-private partnerships like the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership will remain as important as ever to find new innovative antimicrobial treatments. WHO looks forward to working with the AMR Action Fund and all stakeholders to accelerate research and development to address this public health crisis. Finally, whether it's COVID-19 or AMR, the best shot we have is to work together in global solidarity. I thank you. Vielen Dank. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros. That was a very supportive uh, message from the WHO. And now we're going over to another international global organization. Um, I'm welcoming Werner Hoyer, the president of the European Investment Bank from Luxembourg. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Hoyer. Glad you're joining us. Uh, and now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon at this really important e event. Only just a few months ago, we were not really aware how strong the link between public health and the global economy is, and we did not fully understand the societal value of being prepared facing health challenges. This has changed fundamentally. Learning from today's crisis, we need to continue in investing in building up the resilience of countries and health systems to deal with crises, wiping out years of efforts for sustainable development. Looking beyond COVID-19, antimicrobial resistance comes as the next challenge and a growing threat to public health. Regrettably, all efforts in the past were not enough to fill an enormous investment gap and to deliver novel treatment options against priority pathogens. It is of utmost importance that we act now to better, better cope with expected greater resistance in the future. This is where patient investors must come in, must be crowded in. And this fund has the potential to start turning things around. This is also instrumental for Europe's knowledge economy and long-term prosperity, pursuing innovation-intensive business, businesses like the ones participating here today, employing highly qualified people, and providing benefit for society at large. In this field, no success can be achieved without the value created by partnership. In this case, with industry, with philanthropies, and with the World Health Organization and Wellcome Trust. And we at the EU, EU Bank, we are proud of teaming up with you in the Funds Initiation Group. So how can the EU Bank contribute? We set up specific financial instruments to address market failures in the health sector. Currently, we are stepping up our efforts in health and life science, mainly with the aim and we hope to contribute 
to finding solutions for the huge needs related to COVID-19, as we have done before successfully for Ebola, malaria, TBC, AIDS. But our nature is the one of forward-looking investors. And in line with our mandate as the EU bank, we consider the support of innovation and health a priority, relaunching Europe's competitiveness, crowding in private investors, and channel channeling financial resources to societal challenges like AMR, through the issuance of sustainability, sustainability awareness bonds, for instance, dedicated to the health sector. So thank you very much again. It's a pleasure to be part of this initiative. Thank you very much, Werner Hoyer from the European Investment Bank. And uh, we received another short message from the Welcome Trust, uh, which was mentioned before. Uh, Jeremy Farrar sent us uh, his message, and uh, this is what he says. Today, we're all living the shared experience of COVID-19. No one on the planet will avoid the direct or indirect impacts of this pandemic, and none of us would choose to be living through the experience of an infection sweeping the world for which effective treatments and vaccines remain unavailable. But there are other significant health challenges that still require our urgent attention, like drug-resistant infections. The rising tide of antibiotic resistance around the world should be of immense concern to all of us and needs to remain high on the global agenda, even as we deal with COVID-19 pandemic. At Welcome, this has been an organizational priority for us for a number of years now, and we're very proud of the role that we've been able to play in some key areas. We're particularly excited by the way in which CARBEX, established by us in partnership with BADA and also supported by the British and German governments, has led a revival in early stage antibiotic research, along with GARDP and other initiatives. More than 60 projects are now being funded, most in small and medium sized companies, and many with the potential to deliver real breakthroughs. But we've also been concerned for a long time fix for the broken antibiotics market remains elusive, threatening the very survival of the companies who are driving vital innovation. The fragile R&D ecosystem for antibiotics will require efforts from all sectors, governments, philanthropies, and of course, industry to repair. Both these efforts are in all of our interests to pursue. That's why I'm delighted to see the leadership being taken by the pharmaceutical industry in launching the AMR Action Fund today. This significant investment, the biggest single commitment of funds to antibiotic R&D since Carbex was launched four years ago, will provide an urgently needed lifeline for innovators who currently struggle to find investors to support late stage development costs. We must ensure that promising products have a more dependable path from early stage discovery to the patients who need them in all parts of the world. I'm pleased that Welcome has been able to contribute to the development of this idea, and I'm looking forward to seeing how we can continue to play a role in advancing this important effort in the months and in the years to come. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy Farrar. That was another strong statement which underlies the importance of the AMR fund, I think. And now we will talk about the challenges for biotech and startups, about the broader innovation challenge, um, the views of investors and the need for powerful partnerships. And uh, let me kick off with asking Florence Sejourné. She is CEO of a French biotech company, Davoltera, and president of Beam Alliance. Uh, Ms. Sejourné, good afternoon. Could you give us a short impression of how healthy uh, the early R&D biotech pipeline in Europe is. Is there currently enough innovation? Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for welcoming the, the Beam Alliance here. Um, WHO has published a pipeline um, overview in 2020, analyzing 60 antibacterial products in clinical development, but concluded that they bring little benefit over existing treatments, with very few actually targeting the most critical resistant gram-negative bacteria. Drug candidates in, at preclinical stages are more diverse and innovative. About 250 agents are listed by WHO on priority pathogens. 80% of this innovation effort for antibiotics is driven by SMEs in the world, half of it approximately being carried out in Europe. The Beam Alliance, which I represent today, um, regroups 65 European SMEs and altogether cover uh, 100 products with a broad diversity of approaches targeting different stages of the infection process. Uh, 
So to reply to your question, the early R&D uh, biotech pipeline in Europe is very promising and focused on unmet medical need. However, it is certainly not enough and much smaller than those in other fields. Another important characteristics of this pipeline is that it includes strategies which are combined alternative to antibiotics to provide improved treatments or minimize transmission, colonization, and resistance development, and therefore not solely focus on directly killing the pathogen. So combating AMR in the next 20 years on the planet will be efficient by changing our approach of combating infection and using different types of intervention. So although the innovative concepts are there and the issue we face as SMEs is the tremendous lack of funding obviously associated to the perception of too low future financial returns, which is a major risk for the early R&D pipeline to never be even tested up to clinical proof of concept. Uh, well, France, uh, for biotechs and startups, the new AMR fund can be of great benefit. How do you see the fund helping you and helping them? Um, the fund is definitely a wonderful opportunity for Beam Alliance members. First of all, uh, it allows us to believe in a path to rich market. And we're extremely grateful that the pharma companies welcome trucks, WHO and, and EIB, with whom we've had discussion at the Beam Alliance for the last two, three years, have heard our call for urgent action and announced the fund launch today. I understand that the MR fund uh, support would uh, provide as well clinical development, regulatory market positioning advices, which are great for biotechs. You never have enough advice in this highly complex world of drug development, especially on innovative approach to optimize your chances of success. And finally, um, the midterm and long-term exit strategies for biotechs are absolutely key. That means the support of the collaborative platform with industry to restore viable business models for AMR innovation is very important to obtain political response and have investment back to the AMR field. And we will be very happy to collaborate with, uh, as biotechs with the platform um, in the AMR fund. Yes, thank you very much, Florence. Stay with us. Uh, I would like to uh, to broaden the angle a little bit and go to Timo Wölken. He is member of the European Parliament, SDG German. He's vice chair of the European uh, Parliament uh, Interest Group on AMR. And I would like to understand, uh, Mr. Wölken, why is it important for Europeans to be at the forefront of innovation? Yeah. Hello from Brussels. Um, I'm very happy that we are taking the time today to discuss this very important topic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic reminded the world and the European Union of the serious threat of emerging infections, infectious diseases on human health and our economies. It highlighted the need for increased monitoring and surveillance tools, improved infection prevention and control practices, access to rapid diagnostic tests and developing effective and affordable medicines and vaccines. The deficiencies revealed, however, have long been recognized in the fight against AMR. Still not enough has been done to tackle this severe problem. The overusage of antimicrobials has led to a huge increase in multi-resistant bacteria which are easily spread and difficult to treat. If antibiotics stop working, common infections would likely cause significant harm or death and routine medical procedures would be risk. If we act together, I believe we can still reverse the trend while it's keeping the focus of our work on patients and their needs. And let us be honest, AMR is also caused due to a market failure in investing in research and developing of new antibiotics. The current system is designed to generate profit for pharmaceutical companies and the industry is failing to deliver a new health technology for treatments that simply do not and cannot promise high returns of investment. AMR therefore uh, represents a commercial dilemma for the private sector as the development of new drugs is very cost intensive and the new drug would need to be used as little as possible, hence not bringing profit. So I am indeed very happy to see that the industry is stepping up its game, its game and launching an initiative to tackle AMR. This fund is, however, only a first step into the right direction. I know that it is that it has been uh, that this has to be a team play. 
For this reason, the AMR interest group in, at the European Parliament aims to push this topic during this legislation and put pressure on the Commission to come up with a proposal that not only gives guidelines but puts forward mandatory action. Superbugs resistant to antibiotics not only threaten lives, they undermine every aspect of modern medicine. And this is why we need to act now to safeguard the scientific achievements of the last century. And COVID-19 already put our healthcare systems under extreme pressure, but this could only be the foretaste of what we could expect from a world where antimicrobials are no longer effective. And That's, this is why I really wouldn't, would like to thank you for setting up this much-needed fund. It is really great to see that industry is taking this, this, this initiative. Thank you very much, Timo Volken. And I would like to, to talk about another aspect and go over to Italy to Kasim Kutai. He is CEO of Novo Holdings, an investment fund that manages investments and assets to the Novo Nordisk Foundation. Um, Mr. Kutai, what is the economic landscape when it comes to developing new antibiotics? Uh, what are the challenges of creating such a fund since you are also running a fund? Uh, Astrid, uh, thank you. Um, I think we need to divide the uh, economic landscape uh, into uh, two components, or the uh, one is uh, what is going on in the marketplace uh, for these uh, drugs, for these compounds, and then the financial landscape. And unfortunately, on both fronts, uh, it is pretty dire. Um, so first, if we talk about the marketplace, uh, the reality is, and it's the reason why the, we, you keep on hearing about the economic model being broken, it's the reason why there isn't enough of a supply Uh, of antibiotics coming to the market. Um, the volume and the pricing for these products is very unappealing uh, for companies and for investors. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is very good stewardship. When a new antibiotic comes to the market, uh, physicians, uh, doctors are reluctant uh, to use them. Uh, they put them on the back shelf and they're very much uh, a, a last resort. Why? Uh, it is the fear of building resistance uh, to something that is new. Uh, so uh, that, that, that creates a, a significant problem. Physicians uh, are not optimistic, uh, are nervous about when they will see another new antibiotic, given that the pipeline uh, is uh, fairly empty, as we've heard today, and therefore they use whatever new compound comes to the market very sparingly, which is very smart from a public health issue, but of course not great uh, from a revenue generating perspective for the companies that have developed those compounds. The other reason, of course, is pricing antibiotics because they've been around for a long, long time, because we took them for granted for a long, long time, and because many of them are genericized, genericized uh, the pricing is very low. And if you look at the last 10 years, uh, the average uh, revenues Uh, of new antibiotics has been in the range of $50 million. That is just no way near enough to compensate companies and the investors behind them for all the tremendous time and effort and resources to bringing these molecules and products to the market. Now, the other major issue, and it's related to the first, is what I would refer to as the financial situation. And this is one that where we at Nova Holdings with our antimicrobial fund project repair are acutely aware of, which is because of the economic model being broken, investors have fled the antibiotics field. If you look at the share price of publicly traded anti-infective companies, they are significantly down. We're talking about down 50, 60, 70 percent over the last 24 months. Investors no longer want to put money uh, behind uh, these companies and behind these products. And this is why Uh, the action fund uh, is, is so welcome. Uh, and it's very welcome by us uh, at Nova Holdings because the repair impact fund is focused on the earlier stages of development. And we were always counting on other investors to come in and to take the products into the more complicated and more expensive later stages. But with investors having fled the field, 
we were trying to do both at the same time, which is just not practical uh, and frankly is very difficult, uh, particularly with the 165 million budget that our own fund has, which is significant for one investor, but by no means significant in terms of tackling a global problem. So uh, with the IFPMA Action Fund coming in and really acting as a late sp later stage sponsor, both in terms of financial, but also in terms of technical expertise, uh, this is a really welcome problem uh, to the issue that we're all facing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kutai. Well, we have heard earlier from uh, Florence Sejourné about the challenges uh, biotechs and startups are facing in regard to um, innovation for antibiotics. And I would like to ask uh, Stefan Ulrich here in the studi studio from uh, Bayer, uh, could pharma, w w what could pharma actually bring to the table uh, apart from money that small companies don't have? Yeah, thank you, Astrid. That is a good question indeed. When you think back what we've witnessed over the past six months or so, where I think uh, uh, industry on the private side, but also public, uh, public uh, stakeholders, such as governments, university, academia in general, have come together in an unprecedented, not only coalition, but also in a renewed uh, sense of common purpose and trust in all of this, where new relationships have been created and where an unprecedented amount of investment has been done to combat the virus. Uh, and I look at the program that we're all part of here today, uh, I, I feel nothing short but reminded of that. We have the Director General of the United Nations here in the program. Uh, we have um, members of all kinds of institutions like the Wellcome Trust, but also and that is unprecedented in one trust, more than 20 of the top leading pharmaceutical companies. So I think we're sort of like uh, taking the next step in something that uh, maybe before was not uh, that easily thinkable. Actually, uh, uh, before this, this session, we were asking ourselves, has anything like this ever existed before? And we came to the conclusion that it has not. Now, what can we do as companies uh, to support and to increase the probability of making this successful? Most of us have venture arms and invest constantly into startup companies uh, like we do at Bayer. We have a, a, a venture arm that we call Leaps, where we go into uh, breakthrough technology and breakthrough solutions and medicines uh, of problems that are currently unsolved and that really would make a huge difference in people's lives. So with that experience that we have in setting up startup companies, in uh, being agile, uh, in giving them the right financing, giving them also access to in-kind uh, contributions, which, which cannot be, I think, highlighted enough. All of us have, for example, libraries, chemical libraries. All of us have uh, capabilities in toxicology, in, um, uh, in, in, in preclinical testing, which we could give access to, to these uh, uh, small companies. And I think uh, uh, together with this incredible resource, we will increase the probability of success. Thank you, Mr. Ulrich. And uh, I would like to open the panel now for your questions. And uh, we received many questions. And I would like to start with a question from John Rex, F2G, uh, about the rare fungal disease company. He, he asked, what factors could cause this new fund to fail? How can we work to mitigate those factors? And the question goes to Mr. Ulrich again. So first of all, in science, we more often fail than we succeed. So there's no guarantee for success. However, when you look at what we've put together uh, and the endowment of the fund of uh, a billion plus uh, dollars that goes in it, uh, we should, just by judging by probabilities, we should be able to come through with two to four new anti-infective treatments out of the fund. That being said, there will be many that will fail along the way. So I think the best way to uh, to, um, to not fail is uh, fail early uh, instead of waiting long to fail, which in antibiotics normally should be the case because we will quickly see if a mechanism of action works or does not work. And uh, typically the cost in clinical development and also preclinical development increases as we go along. So if we can have many uh, shots on goal, so to speak, in the beginning, uh, that will allow us to come through with two to four in the end. Thank you very much. Here comes another question from uh, J.K. Lyre. Uh, it goes to uh, Mr. Oshman. Um, it's about access to Medicines Foundation. 
Uh, 83% of the world's population live in low, live in low and middle income countries. How do we ensure that the antibiotics being developed in the pipeline also be appropriately available to those living in low and middle income countries? Are there guarantees are being asked from the innovators that if they benefit from funds, these products must be made available and accessible quickly in LMICs, Mr. Oshman. Income countries. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that is obviously a very important question for anything about, uh, yes. about health. We've, we've had a lot of discussion on this when it comes to HIV treatments, when it comes to vaccines, and we've seen so many successful public-private partnerships in this, you know, we have seen a lot happening uh, when, it, when it comes to HIV treatment, uh, Gavi in uh, Gavi in the vaccines area. We have seen in oncology, we've seen a major initiative in which many of us were also involved, such as uh, such as Access Accelerated. So the question is important. Uh, what we must do once we have novel antibiotics, and we, I mean, we, we cannot take that we, we cannot take that for granted, is to find a mechanism so that people in low and middle income countries will, get, will gain access. What we must do at the same time, and that is a big global challenge to all of us, is that we must all work together to strengthen healthcare systems in low and middle income, low and middle income countries. If you look at, uh, if you're a cancer patient in, uh, in uh, many regions in Africa and you want to have access to treatment, there is no oncologist, there is no surgeon, there is no radiologist, there is no, pa uh, uh, there is no pathologist. So the, the sheer availability of drugs in areas where there is no functioning healthcare system doesn't help. So it's a huge effort. The industry has done a lot in this, uh, in this respect. Most of our member companies in IFPMA do not enforce patents in, uh, in, in, low, uh, in low income countries. Uh, most of our members have special access, uh, access programs. To, in, uh, to enable better access uh, for, for the poor who have a, 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 specific, a specific need. And we have also many partnerships. For instance, in the area of neglected tropical diseases, many of us have worked together with WHO, with other players, to help tackle, uh, tackle these problems. So I'm quite confident that we will find the right mechanisms. Thank you very much. Um, we've got another question, and this goes to uh, Thomas. Uh, could you briefly answer to this question, Thomas? It's by, for a question by uh, Guard uh, P. Uh, we are still very concerned about a valley of death that exists from phase three clinical trials and into access, meaning that important antibiotics will not be available to those who need them. What can governments and the pharmaceutical industry do to <coughs> ensure antibiotics get to the right populations, in the right places, in the right way, and in a timely manner. I think as Dr. Tedros has already indicated, we need partnership. We need to work together. And Stefan Oshman outlined the complexities of access because the problem with antibiotics is you want to bring them to the people who need them, but you also want to ensure that they are used appropriately. And if the health systems are not there, that's almost a contradiction in C. And uh, Sally Davis also alluded to it. We really need to ensure that we have the systems in place, that we will not run within years into new resistance. <clears throat> but we also, that's why we worked early on with the likes of WHO, Welcome Trust, because part of the fund is we already talked about access commitments. We already talked about the need for stewardship provisions, which means appropriate use. And I think God P, for example, which is a joint venture of WHO and initially the, the Rare Disease Initiative, is one of those examples, which also I'm looking forward to working with them. Okay, thank you. So there is one last question from uh, Helmut Kessmann, and I would like to put it to Florence Sejourné. She's still with us. 
Um, could you please answer briefly, Mrs. Sur oh, she just left the, oh my God. Okay, this, these, are <laughs> this is, these are the technical problems we have in those days. So um, anyway, the question is, uh, we have a lack of innovative drugs to treat AMR and we have a lack of talents to discover and develop such drugs. So how can we address the talent issue most productively? Um, Mr. Ulrich, what is your answer for this? Well, we, we need to make sure that uh, we have um, the right talents coming out of academia. Uh, and typically that's, that's the pathway uh, to creating startups. We need to have the right academic knowledge from there. Typically we will uh, now have an ability to equip with the funding uh, those that have the ideas and, and go into, uh, into a startup mode. mode. Uh, and we have uh, infectious disease services in every university hospital uh, in the world. And I don't think that we're at, at lack of talent there. But many uh, have said it here before today, there has been a market failure uh, in the development of antimicrobials. And we equip now those that have the ideas uh, and are willing to, to create uh, those companies, we have the funding to support them in doing so. So that gives me confidence that we can do so by uh, giving all the support, both in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of money, uh, which hasn't existed to the same degree before. Well, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers, all the panelists uh, at this point. Uh, I would like to broaden the debate now and see how politics is responding to the new AMR initiative. And it's a great pleasure for us to uh, welcome uh, uh, three ministers here with us and also the European Commission for Health and uh, many more people. And first, I would like to greet the Federal Minister of Health in Germany. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Spahn. Uh, Germany has played a big role on the international stage in raising the issue of AMR. Um, so it's going to be particularly interesting to get your estimation on the antibiotic innovation challenge. Um, so, Mr. Spahn, I hear can, you don't have a sound. Can you hear me now? Mr. Spahn? I can hear you. Yes, okay. can you hear me? Yes, now everything is fine. Wonderful. I was just introducing you and uh, actually I want to leave the floor now to you, Mr. Spahn. Thank you very much uh, indeed. As every video conference these days and every international conference, it always takes a minute till it really works. But now I'm here. Thank you very much. And thank you for this conference and uh, the announcement today. Actually, modern medicine would be inconceivable without antibiotics. So ever since they were introduced, huge progress has been possible in the treatment of serious bacterial infections. They also play a, a role during the COVID-19 pandemic as an important component in the treatment of cases where serious clinical progression is accompanied by bacterial infections. That is why it is even more disturbing to observe the rising numbers of resistant bacterial strains against which one or even multiple antibiotics are ineffective. This increase in antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance is by no means an isolated phenomenon. Antimicrobial that is not an easy word for a German. Antimicrobial resistance is a global challenge, and it is a challenge for us as a community worldwide, for human and veterinary medicine, for science and research, and for the pharmaceutical and diagnostic industry as well. What we all want, all sectors and all of those involved is more progress in modern medicine, more successful outcomes through the use of antibiotics, and more options that give people hope for healing. There is no other choice. We must continue to pursue our joint efforts and do everything in our power to combat antimicrobial resistance. To succeed, we will need not only one, but a whole bundle of measures. WHO's Global Action Plan provides us with a sound, globally applicable blueprint for achieving this. It contains elements such as the setting up of surveillance systems, the strengthening of infection prevention, or the proper use of antibiotics. Here in Germany, the Federal Ministry of Health collaborated with other federal ministries in translating this global plan into a national one, developing the German Antibiotics Resistance Strategy, or DART 2020. A central objective of the strategy is to make decisive advances 
in research and development, a task at which we will be most successful if we work together, uh, also internationally across borders. And Corona is a case in point. Developing new antibiotics comes at a high cost, both scientific and financial. Many pharmaceutical firms have abandoned the field of development. This makes several initiatives that may past years all the more important and valuable. And Germany, for example, is very much engaged in the global AMR R&D hub that we launched two years ago in Geneva. In this scenario, the new AMR Action Fund represents another valuable building block. With the AMR Action Fund, the pharmaceutical industry complements the already established initiatives and makes an important contribution to our shared goal giving people access to substances that fight bacterial infections and, with them, justifiable hope for healing. My wish is to see the new AMR Action Fund coordinate its activities closely with the already existing initiatives. This will avoid the unnecessary duplication of measures. Our resources are limited. All of our efforts should be focused on those areas where public health sees the, great, sees the greatest need and, for example, the WHO priority pathogens list for R&D of new antibiotics is a good uh, leading agenda for this. In addition, antibiotic stewardship should already be considered when new antibiotics are in the development phase. I cannot stress this enough. Developing new successful antibiotics, as well as avoiding and combating resistance, are among the most urgent challenges of our global health. We should not relent in our efforts to address this challenge. I thank those responsible and those participating in the AMR Action Fund for choosing to make an important contribution to these efforts. And actually, thank you as well for reminding us in a time when we all are talking uh, and dealing with a virus that is hard to deal with, that there are other challenges that need to be met. And this is one of the most important ones. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Spahn. So please stay in line. We're very glad that you will join our panel discussion, which follows. Uh, now, we are very happy that Mr. Magnus Heunicke, Minister of Health and Senior Citizens Denmark, is joining us as well. How is Denmark regarding the fight against AMR? Uh, we received a video message from Mr. Heunicke, and this is what he says. Thank you for inviting me to address the AMR challenge in the light of the coronavirus pandemic. And first of all, allow me to express my gratitude to the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations for setting up this event in a challenging time. It's important not to forget how AMR is still a threat, a threat that is even more urgent to handle in the light of the COVID-19 crisis. I'm coming to you from the Danish island of Bornholm in the Baltic Sea, and let me start by confessing something to you. When we had the financial crisis some 12 years ago, people told me, don't waste a good crisis. And I didn't, I didn't understand a word. People lost their jobs, companies went bankrupt. What took generations to build was torn down in a matter of weeks. Well, now we are in another crisis, in a health crisis, the health crisis of our generation. And now I am beginning to understand because now we have to act together. Now we must promise each other to learn from this. And now we must see to that we are better prepared for the next healthcare crisis. So let me get straight to the point. With antimicrobial resistance, we are dealing with a global threat. What is described as a slow motion tsunami that has accelerated due to the COVID-19 virus. The pandemic has shaken our way of thinking about healthcare. We must remember that we are dealing with a kind of paradox here. On one hand, we all know how vital antimicrobials are due to defend us against infections. On the other hand, we know that misuse and 
overuse can lead to the failure of these life-saving treatments. In fact, it is with open eyes that we see how AMR can threaten the very foundations on which modern medicine and life is built. We are so used to rely on mir miraculous inventions like Alexander Fleming's penicillin made some 90 years ago. The discovery of antibiotics was a breakthrough for mankind, making it possible to defeat diseases that people used to die of. Today we are facing a serious threat. Misguided and irresponsible use of antibiotics has led to the spread of AMR. We face a future where an estimated 10 million people worldwide will die every year because we can no longer treat infections effectively. The potential human consequences of AMR are tremendous and it will influence global economy and growth. So let's face it, it is time for us all to recall the declaration by the WHO from 2011 that said the world is on the brink of losing these miracle cures. On top of the AMR challenge, the global, the global COVID-19 pandemic has made a strong, strategic and systematic global focus on AMR even more important. And like the coronavirus, AMR does not recognize country borders or the distinction between sectors. As seen with the corona pandemic, also resistant bacteria spreads with enormous range and speed throughout the world. This is exactly why we need to join our efforts, research and funding in order to fight AMR together. COVID-19 is currently challenging the entire world. It causes severe pressure on healthcare systems throughout the world with overcrowding in hospitals and healthcare facilities as a result. In addition, many patients admitted with coronavirus to hospitals receive antibiotics for the prevention and treatment of secondary bacterial infections. This contributes to escalate the AMR challenge. For years, scientists have raised their voices and to some extent, the call to governments for action has been heard. And I fully recognize the efforts by countries, international organizations and the life science companies to tackle the AMR challenge. However, we are facing a crucial gap between policy and action. It seems that we are more comfortable in producing scientific articles and policy plans than in facing the real challenge. We need more answers to a crucial question on how we can transform science and policy into solutions that will work in the real world. Bodies at all levels, not least the WHO and FAO, play an essential role in creating the policy framework for our common fight against AMR. However, major knowledge gap remain when it comes to translating policy into action. In addition, when it comes to developing effective solutions, we need to take into account all aspects of the One Health approach. We know a lot about how to control AMR, but what works in one part of the world is not easily transferred to other parts of the world. In particular, we need to find solutions that respond to the specific context of low and middle income countries. There's an urgent need to provide practical guidance on the implementation of feasible solutions, especially in low and middle income countries. Some of the lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis must be that we need to prepare ourselves even better for similar health challenges in the future. And here, the global focus on AMR is vital. In response to this need, Denmark, based on constructive and supportive discussions with the World Bank, began the establishment of the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, ICANS, in short. This underlines that Denmark gives high priority to the fight against AMR. We have been working hard to establish an independent ICANS. The Danish government has allocated funds to establish ICANS, but ICANS is and should be a partnership. Therefore, I invite all to join to work with us to develop the center. Now is the time to accelerate global action against AMR. Partnership with ICARS would be a concrete next step for us to take together. 
In closing, let me assure you that the Danish government now more than ever is fully dedicated to ICARS and to the global fight against AMR. The coronavirus reminds us of our dependence of public health on the availability of effective medicine. It has made the alarm bells ring worldwide. COVID-19 has pushed the urgency for global focus and for action now. We cannot allow the world to lose its most powerful tool in healthcare, antibiotics. We must take action now. Not least since AMR is a predictable and preventable crisis, unlike the unpredictable evolution of COVID-19. Therefore, I once again thank the organizers to, for today's event for highlighting the importance of the fight against AMR. In addition, I welcome and acknowledge your dedication towards new initiatives that can take on the antibiotic innovative challenge. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much. And now let's go from Denmark to France. Uh, we will hear from another minister, followed by the European Commissioner for Health and other speakers. Uh, good afternoon to Agnès Pannier-Runacher, the Minister of Industry in France. Uh, Madame Minister, what is the French government doing for the health industry? Can we learn from the COVID-19 experience? Thank you very much. I hope that the image is not too blurred. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, hear about France. The French health industry, this is 450 biotechs, this is circa 300 industrial plants, and this is 100,000 people working. We have a steady ecosystem for health research, public research through top-notch organizations such as in some hospitals linked with university and public-private partnerships. Since President Macron came to office, health industry has been a policy priority. Therefore, we launched a program in 2018 to improve the attractiveness of French for the health sector and created a council for health industry chaired by our president and gathering key health global companies. COVID-19 obviously showed how important is the health industry for your country and the region such as Europe. Even if our companies adapt quickly their production to the situation, we also face difficulties linked to our excessive reliance on intermediate products. That's why we need to rebuild resilience for our health industry. We need a European approach and develop production in Europe. We have to develop specifically a capacity to produce active principle or antibiotics. We should use IPCI tool as we did with electric batteries last year. It has proven to be quite effective. And this is a clear, concrete tool that will help to rebuild resilience of Europe and, of course, France. In France, we are now accelerating projects of relocating health production sites. We have a set and we know where our weaknesses lie. Too much red tape, for sure, uh, not very easy access to the market and a very aggressive pricing. But all these elements can be tackled, and this is clearly what we are doing now to improve the access to go to market for new molecules, but also for uh, all companies that intend to invest and to relocate uh, production in France. So, my key message would be to the health companies do not hesitate to consider investing in France. Uh, we believe that we are here to ease the projects. And we have to do it also at the European level. Um, from my perspective, fighting against uh, AMR is a global priority and uh, the risk is a key of what we are currently living at the global level with COVID-19 pandemic. That's why we need deeply those kind of uh, tools such as AMR fund uh, to access the market because it will help our biotechs to be part of the, of the effort to fight against AMR resistance. 
France wants to take its share of the efforts to find antimicrobial resistance and nosocomial infections. So we will help consortium for R&D projects in this sector, and we will try to find also new business cases for these drugs as the existing business models are not working well, as you know, it's not competitive enough. And that's why we've asked Jean Tirol, which is a French economist, but also uh, who was awarded the Nobel Prize, to work on those business models to allow useful old antibiotics to remain on the market, but also new medicals to go to market with uh, um, global financing that is working. Because those new medicals, you, don't, you have to avoid to use them but you have to finance the search to produce them. So this is quite a, a difficult situation. We are quite keen to support this new initiative uh, on AMR uh, fight against um, AMR, and uh, we will support any European project that will help not only to fight against COVID, but to rebuild a strong and resilient European health uh, capabilities. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Panier Runache. Thank you very much to Paris. And now we switch to Brussels. And it's a pleasure for us to welcome the European Commissioner for Health and Food Safety, Stella Kyriakidis. And uh, she is delivering a statement now. Good afternoon. And uh, the stage is yours, Madame. Thank you so much. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dear ministers, ladies and gentlemen. Antibiotics are critical to protect public health and save lives. It is one of the most powerful tools we have in healthcare. But the rising levels of antimicrobial resistance and the devastating implications of resistance superbugs present an unprecedented and urgent global challenge. Consequences on public health and our economies can be far reaching. But unlike a health crisis, Antimicrobial resistance is not only predictable, it is also preventable. Tackling antimicrobial resistance is in everyone's interest. It is everyone's responsibility and it should be everyone's priority. Through our One Health Action Plan against antimicrobial resistance, we aim to tackle the underlying reasons for AMR and support the development of new antibiotics. To do so, one of our key objectives is to boost research, development, and innovation. We need research to develop quick tests to, to know whether antibiotics are the proper treatment. To limit the use of antibiotics, proper diagnostics is key. We also aim to make the EU a best practice region and a global leader on tackling antimicrobial resistance and remain committed to working with our international partners to develop a strategic global approach. We will continue to advocate for European standards, which are amongst the highest in the world, and to support all our partner countries in this area. Our shared goal in this area should be to build international consensus that will lead us to a global agreement to tackle AMR. It is only together through cooperation and commitment, that we can form a strong alliance in this fight to protect public health. We have seen this with the recent global pandemic of COVID-19. No state, no region can do this alone. What we need now is global action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for this uh, strong statement. And I would like to ask uh, Stefan Oshman, Chairman of the Executive Board and CEO of Merck. Um, Mr. Oshman, what makes the development and commercialization of new antibiotics so different from other innovation challenges in the healthcare industry? And why does this in, uh, require a, an entirely different approach? Well, there are scientific challenges. I was early in my career, I was uh, developed, uh, involved in antibiotics development myself. So let's say in the 1980s, 1990s, when we experienced a, sort of a golden era uh, of, uh, of innovation. Nowadays, we see that uh, most of the problems are 
of the, the AMR problems are caused by gram-negative bacteria. This is a biological challenge that uh, they have a, they're sort of they're encapsulated by a membrane, and it's very difficult to get uh, to get substances in, uh, into these uh, into these bacteria. But it's not insurmountable. It's uh, it's something we can tackle. And if you look at the tremendous progress we've made in other disease areas over the past years, like, uh, like in cancer, if we really focus on it, we can, uh, we, we can address it. The real problem with regard to developing novel antibiotics, resistance breakers, or whatever we want, we, we want to call it, is a financing problem. That's why we have this fund. Often, uh, small startups Develop, uh, develop this innovation. It is ac uh, people from academia who have an idea and who then create a, st uh, who create a startup, and our fund is going to help finance that. But at the same time, we need a different type of in incentive system in the market because physicians rightfully don't want to use these novel antibiotics, but they need to have them available. They need to keep them, they need to keep them in, in reserve. And a system that would only pay for consumption would be would be wrong so we need to get together and I'm so encouraged by the ministers of health by the uh, by the uh, by the commissioner who participating in this event maybe we can work together involving patient organizations other stakeholders and define uh, and define a system that will really foster a lot more progress in this important area mm -hmm. I would also like to involve again uh, the German health minister Jens Spahn is he still in line I'm asking here? Yes. Yes, he is. Okay. So, Mr. Spahn, uh, uh, could you please tell me the German uh, government has done more than many other countries to put the topic on the world agenda, but now against the backdrop of the challenge of COVID-19, uh, is there a chance that the AMR plan will not get the attention, uh, the desired attention during the Germany's uh, EU presidency? Well, it definitely will get all the attention it needs and it uh, deserves, actually. What Mr. Oshman just said is, is very important. And I mean, what we, what we see in this crisis, in this COVID-19 pandemic, is uh, that if we put forces together, uh, uh, the, the states, uh, but uh, the industry as well, and, and science, uh, then we really can make a difference. I mean, this might be, I, we know, don't know yet if it really works, but this might be uh, uh, the, the, the shortest period from the uh, detection of a new virus till there is a vaccine available, perhaps within a year, if it really uh, works very well uh, and we are very, can be optimistic. Um, and if that is possible regarding a virus in this specific situation, why shouldn't there be more possible in other areas like in this of AMR? Um, so we really see now what difference we can make if worldwide we put all forces together and we all uh, put into it not just money and resources, uh, but science and the political will actually to make things happen. And that actually is very encouraging, I think, uh, for this new fund and the initiatives around AMR. Uh, and if we, if we keep on working on this, and of course it will be highlighted, not just uh, during our presidency, but within the G7 forum, the G20 forum, the WHO, and as it has been in the, in the past, uh, uh, then actually we really can make a difference. And this new fund is one important uh, tool and a big tool with one billion actually uh, in it uh, uh, that that can make uh, that really can yeah can help uh, to to speed this up so but i really have learned in the past weeks is we we can make a difference uh, and we can make things really quicker than they used to be why should that not be possible for amr as well <laughs> yes, that was an encouraging message. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Spahn. I would like to ask uh, Natalie Moll, who is the Director General of EFPIA. She's online now. Uh, EFPIA uh, is the voice of the research-based pharmaceutical industry operating in Europe. Uh, so, Natalie, what do you think, what uh, types of incentives could be needed to support innovation? We talked about incentives before, but what types specifically? What are you thinking of? 
Well, um, thank you, Astrid, and uh, good afternoon. Indeed, the ecosystem to develop a pharmaceutical product is quite complex. We heard it. You need um, specific incentives at the R&D phase, but you also need a support system all the way through from the development of the manufacturing to the placing on the market. And in the case of AMR, the business model, as was mentioned by the Commissioner and many others, is very different. You're not supposed to sell many of these products. You're certainly not supposed to use many either. So you really need to think about a new business model that can still sustain the research, development, manufacturing, and then placing on the market of these products. And, and that means that in addition to the push incentives on the R&D side, you need support in that value of debt that you mentioned earlier, that the fund, the AMR fund now is, is proposing. And then you need the pull incentives. Um, and the, here there's really an urgency and it's very good to see that reflected in the pharmaceutical strategy roadmap of the European Commission, uh, an urgency to look at the business model, the new what, what kind of business model we can develop for the specific area, and tailor the incentives. So I don't have an answer today on which are the right incentives, because every region will require different incentives depending on the different needs of the ecosystem. But certainly, we need to be very clear that we need to look at this from, um, if you like, from the cradle all the way to the end, and make sure that we also sustainably manage the use of anti anti antibiotics as they are done. Um, what I would just like to say is this fund really complements a lot of other initiatives. At European level, we have the Innovative Medicines Initiative that has 12 projects on AMR running for quite a number of years. And the infrastructure and the knowledge um, that have been developed in those, structure, in those um, projects would accelerate the work done by the SMEs and supported by the fund. So everything is really working together and that urgency for global collaboration collaborative action that the Commissioner was mentioned is really reflected today in the um, presence of all the speakers and it's very encouraging to see that. Thank you. Yes, Natalie, uh, I have one more question. Can you tell me what is your expectation towards the German uh, presidency of the EU Council? Well, I mean, um, as you mentioned, the German government has done many, has done a lot and has put this topic very high on the agenda uh, of, 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 the, of the very global platforms. But here at European level, we really need a reflection on how um, can we look into the topic of AMR, which is urgent. And if we do not act today, we could really undo decades of um, research. Um, how, do, how do we look into this and effectively take action and create that sustainable environment ecosystem at European level to ensure that we can continue to innovate and bring novel antibiotics on the market? Um, the fund is a bridging and that's very good, but ultimately we're looking for a sustainable ecosystem that will not require that and that can allow the development of the right antibiotics uh, to meet the challenges of AMR. Thank you very much, Natalie Moll. Now, I would like to open uh, the floor for your questions now, and we receive many of your questions. I would like to start with a question from uh, Ilona Kickbush, and uh, I would like to pass it to the German Minister of Health, if he still is online. Oh, yes, he is. So, uh, Ilona Kickbush is from the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Genova, and she is asking, uh, we are experiencing a major shift in global health, and we are now talking billions of investment rather than millions in terms of ODA, Official Development Assistance. We are also focusing on issues that affect both developed and developing countries, like AMR, like COVID-19, vaccine, etc. What would be next steps to develop reliable financing models for such common goods beyond ODA, special fundraising initiatives and re replenishment models that bring together the public and the private sector? Uh, can the European Union play a special role in taking such a new global agenda forward, Mr. Spahn? Well, that's a big question and a big task. Um, but nevertheless, of course, we, we can and we, we want to. And we want to engage more as a European Union and as member states of the European Union. And I would say what we should do, could do, must do is to do it more coordinated. Right now, uh, in many areas like research, we have 27 uh, approaches, actually, and uh, 27 uh, main focuses. 
and, and that can be in, at least in some areas like AMR uh, that can be done uh, uh, more better coordinated and uh, through this uh, more more effective and if we can do it within Europe with 27 that is already sometimes difficult to do but it is doable and deliverable uh, if we can do it on a European level and perhaps make it to a European added value by doing it through the EU budget, for example, which is to be uh, negotiated in the upcoming months, then, of course, we can do it on an international level too. And uh, what, I, uh, what I want, for example, is that the European Union plays uh, a, a bigger role, takes a bigger role within the WHO, for example. I, I definitely want to do... Uh, not everything, but almost everything to keep the U.S. within the WHO. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the European Union can do more uh, in this multi multilateral organization and an organization like the WHO, as it already has been, uh, it can be a good tool or a good uh, platform actually to coordinate better uh, all, uh, all, all these initiatives. And that is actually what um, the president of Ghana, the Prime Minister of Norway and the German Chancellor asked for uh, when they said let's have, a uh, let's have an action plan uh, for the SDG 3 uh, on global health, uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 3, uh, that there are not just many, many international organizations and everyone has his, uh, its own focus, let's better coordinate it. And for the first time, actually, uh, we have managed that there is an action plan and all these international organizations in health, public and private, WHO, World Bank, UNAIDS, Gavi, CP, and many, many others uh, have uh, developed first step on the paper, uh, how to better coordinate the action, and now, step by step, they are doing it on the ground. And that already makes, uh, makes a difference. So I would say what we really need to do within the EU and internationally is to better coordinate where we focus uh, uh, on, and then we can make already a difference with all the resources that are already there, but not uh, enough coordinated. Thank you very much, Mr. Spahn. So we are getting more and more questions, and I want to uh, pass forward one question quickly to Thomas Cuny. Uh, if you could uh, answer briefly, please. The question was put by Enrico Baraldi. Uh, will this new fund collab collaborate with existing pipeline coordinators like CARB-X, GARD-P, Enable, and also with the G20 Global AMR R&D Hub? I think it's all about partnership. And as we just heard from Minister Spahn and from others, we really need to work together. We see this as a complementary action to, for example, Gard P as well as Carbex. As Florent Sejourné said, the small biotech companies who, thanks of these, to these initiatives, are bringing new interesting candidates which need funding of clinical research they're desperate for somebody coming up with funding for this research, and that's where the fund will play a major role. But we also need the support from the governments, as we just heard uh, from the ministers, because at the end of the day, we need a longer-term solution which makes uh, research into antibiotics interesting again. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so we got more questions here. Uh, one question is by Mark Pearson, Deputy Director of Employment, Labor and Social Affairs at the OECD. Uh, and this question goes to Agnès Pannier-Runacher. Uh, he, he says, congratulations on this wonderful initiative. We at OECD have been involved in quite a bit of work on the economic impact on AMR, most recently with a publication stemming the tide, just a few dollars more. We would be delighted to add our economic ex expertise um, to the necessary debate about the need for pull incentives. Would such contribution be welcomed by governments and by the industry? Mrs. Panier Renaché. Yes, it will. I'm sure that uh, we will appreciate having the support of the OECD on this uh, uh, fight. And uh, of course, we need to uh, have a, um, I mean, everybody has to uh, be part of the fight and uh, OECD has a, its role to play. This is not only a question of health, this is also a question of economy, of resilience. And 
um, I would say when it comes to the health sector, uh, we need to enhance our footprint. This is exactly what the COVID-19 shows. We cannot be dependent on key elements uh, to, uh, from, to other countries. So uh, I would uh, really support the, the help of OECD. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I also would like to pass the question to Thomas. Uh, what do you say about this uh, great support by the OECD? So would we. Uh, I can only share what uh, the Minister of Industry just said. OECD has a unique know-how and expertise in economics. And one of the elements which we need to combine is we not only need to look at the costs of treating antimicrobial resistance, we need to look at the economic costs, which AMR costs. And uh, all, Lord O'Neill already six years ago and the World Bank and OECD since then have come up with reports which show investing in R&D and providing the incentives in R&D would be probably one of the best investments governments could do. Mm -hmm. So here comes uh, the next question uh, to Stefan Oschmann. Uh, Health Industry Hub Media asks, what is the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in this context? You know, we see that in the whole area of drug discovery uh, and drug development that uh, data integration, data analytics, data science, artificial intelligence is gaining in, uh, is gaining in importance. There are many, uh, many startup companies also in this area that provide, uh, uh, that provide expertise. To give you an example, for instance, uh, in, in the COVID-19 COVID crisis right now, I have almost every day, I have some AI player coming to me saying, look, we have looked through the, you, our libraries. You have a drug, you have a, you have a, a, a drug ca candidate in your library that might have uh, antiviral uh, antiviral uh, activity and exactly the same applies uh, uh, applies to uh, to AMR drug discovery and drug development today without big data approaches and without AI is unthinkable okay thank you very much uh, another question uh, we have for mr. Ulrich um, as we know, it takes a very long time to bring a new molecule to patients and to the market. Will the stakeholders of the fund engage the regulatory agencies to fast track approval of promising therapeutic candidates? So the answer is simple, yes, of course. We do this, by the way, all the time when there is breakthrough technology or something that really advances medicine, we ask for a priority review by the agencies. The, um, positive here on antibiotic development is that for uh, the outcome that you need to prove in clinical trials is something that you can do in a relatively short period of time. So once we have a, made the discovery, the clinical trial period for this type of uh, uh, activity or for this type of indication is probably going to be uh, shorter in time, which is why we're confident to get uh, between two and four um, uh, products and true medicines that, that will make a difference to patients within the next 10 years, which for our line of business, from the inception of an idea to a clinical trial to an approval by an agency is a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, Thomas, the uh, German magazine Wirtschaftswoche would like to know, uh, with this new AMR Action Fund, who exactly decides how much money goes to whom? Not the investors, not the companies. Uh, we have deliberately decided that we need an independent scientific advisory board with the best minds in the antibiotic research and public health business. And they will make the recommendations and the fund will not invest in areas which are not recommended by this scientific advisory board. We have also deliberately said that we want to focus on priority pathogens, which are included in the WHO list of priority pathogens or on the CDC list of priority, which means this is really about meeting public health needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Oshman, um, I also would like to um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the role of the politics again, since we have all the politicians here gathered. Uh, from the industry perspective, what is needed from uh, governments uh, and other bodies to ensure there is a sustainable pipeline for antibiotics in the future? It's, it's, a, it's several areas. We were talking about the need for public-private uh, partnerships. I would also want to highlight uh, from, a, from a European point of view specifically, and we are learning that in the COVID-19 crisis right now, is that we need to strengthen the, the European innovation ecosystem. We see that in, other, that in other areas there is a stronger connectivity between academia, big corporations, uh, government, uh, venture uh, venture capital and the uh, and the startup scene. I think we have we can really improve things uh, in Europe. We can strengthen the uh, the innovation ecosystem. I mentioned before that I think we need to have a uh, a new incentive system in areas where there is market failure, such as uh, such as here. And then lastly, I would like to add that since we have uh, such important people, EU Commission, ministers of health, uh, in in the call, I think we also need a regu we need regulatory reform. Regulatory standards have been defined for the period of let's say the 1980s or 1990s, and we need we need to have as much progress in the antimicrobial regulatory field as we had in cancer. You know, the US FDA, the Chinese FDA, the European Medicines Agency have made so much progress and have really fostered progress in cancer. And we, we have treatments available now that we couldn't even dream of a couple of years ago. Uh, the same is necessary in, in the field of antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Ulrich, um, again, the incentives, it's, a, it's an interesting question. You've said that we need to see pull incentives, but thus far only the UK is making uh, solid progress uh, on implementation and their program can't carry the world. So what happens if we don't have significant global pull incentives in place three to five years from now? So we made this decision to create the fund because uh, we wouldn't wait for others to make decisions. This is uh, this group coming together of the, the leading pharmaceutical companies of the world, together with, with the Wellcome Trust, uh, together with WHO, together with the European Investment Bank, saying uh, we need to take action now. So we hope that this impulse that we're giving will also trigger others to follow suit. We've said that we're up to almost one billion in uh, in how much we funded uh, the, this initiative, uh, we hope to add more to it. And we hope to also have uh, policymakers uh, go out and support to create uh, incentives for uh, to trigger investment and also young uh, academics uh, to take the leap and, and jump into creating startups. So this is academia that also needs to create an environment in which uh, we support our young uh, researchers, young physicians uh, that have great ideas to actually take that, take that leap of faith and, and go and, and fund uh, new companies. That's something that, for example, in Europe is not as usual as it may be in Israel or as it may be in, in the United States of America. So there's some, uh, some support we can, we can always uh, hopefully count on from mm -hmm. uh, people like, and I know Jens Spahn is very supportive of mm -hmm. this uh, uh, as, as, as we know him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I would like to do one last quick round and ask uh, all the people who are online now from France, from uh, Germany, um, and also Nathalie Moll. Uh, again, if you have just one phrase, one sentence, what is your wish for, for the new AMR uh, Action Fund? Mr. Spahn, maybe you start. Well, success. <laughs> it is as easy uh, as it is. As we, we, I wish it success that it is able to do good investments uh, with the scientific board leading to, to the investment and that we will have a good cooperation, a good cooperation between uh, privately run companies uh, and uh, the public uh, and states. And if there are, by the way, good ideas for uh, 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 yeah, changing, developing uh, the framework, as Stefan Oschmann just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, I think uh, we, we, we should have a look. Please, uh, please let us know. 
uh, what the ideas are, and because when it comes to the regulatory framework, I would say we can uh, we can make a difference as soon as we make it uh, concrete. Uh, when we have concrete ideas, how to set the right incentives. I know the UK approach. Um, uh, I will have another look uh, how how well it works. But what we need is in the end concrete tools, uh, concrete uh, uh, approaches. This fund is one, and if there are others that can be. Uh, led uh, by the public institutions, by the states, I'm happy to engage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Madame uh, uh, panier Runache. what is your she wish for the, for the new fund? Well, I would, I would bounce back on what uh, Jens Spahn said, that is success. Success means having the possibility to enroll not only biotechs, but also any kind of uh, uh, companies that may play a role, maybe expand the fund to new types of uh, approaches. I think of uh, diagnosis, for instance, because it could also help to fight against uh, antibiotic resistance and um, to have a, a full approach from fundamental research to go to market approach. That means being in a position to define the business case that can help to, to have those incentives for the companies because we do know that this is a, a very specific approach to develop molecules that you don't want to use. So uh, we need to have also a very uh, uh, fundamental economic research to, to help to define the right tools and the right incentives to be able to, to be accurate, to kind of tackle this issue. And bear in mind that we have been through, uh, we are now through uh, COVID-19, but it could have been uh, a problem with antibiotic resistance and it could have had the same kind of consequences. Thank you very much. And uh, Natalie Moll, what is your wish? Well, Astrid, it's really encouraging to see that the launch of the fund has done exactly what we were hoping for. It's really channeled also the political attention to uh, want to complement the fund with the necessary market reforms that will ensure a sustainable development of new antibiotics. This is exactly what we need, what the ministers both mentioned. We need that careful analysis of which are the incentives that can be developed uh, on the market side to make sure that we can fix this business model that is a little bit particular and we can find a sustainable way forward together. So I'm really encouraged and uh, I'm glad that we as an industry could step up to the plate and begin this um, positive uh, move towards sustainability. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all of you joining our discussion and taking time in these very tense uh, days. So thanks a lot. We appreciate very much your input. And um, now comes the, the moment, the moment of truth, actually. Thomas Cooney, uh, the official kickoff of the AMR fund. So can you start the ball rolling? <laughs> Thank you very much, Astrid. I think I can be short and succinct in revealing the logo, the name of the fund, which yes. we already talked about, as well as wrapping up the discussion which we had. When you look at it, we were talking a lot about this is not a solution in itself. It's a bridging solution. The AMR Action Fund, as it is called, aims to provide a bridge, aims to bring two to four new antibiotics to the market and is a signal of marking a historic milestone in the industry stepping up and responding. And I think honestly, we have to admit also responding to criticism of an industry which has exited the field over quite many years because there is no economic model right now. And we strongly believe that we need to recreate this economic model, but we are willing to step up. We are willing to companies are willing to invest and provide this bridge. And I must say I was heartened when I listened to the ministers, when I listened to the other health leaders. We have over the last few months seen how much you can achieve in sh such a short period. We have also seen the importance of an existing innovation ecosystem. We couldn't look at new treatments for COVID-19 at such a speed or have more than 200 vaccines, you know, in candidates if it weren't based on an overall extremely successful 
competitive industry business model. AMR is different. AMR is more like the neglected tropical disease. And we need to think about the new incentives, how to do it. But the industry is willing to step up. It is also willing to step up in partnership, as we are right now in Geneva. We are an act, a founding partner of the Act Accelerate Against COVID-19. And I was heartened to hear Minister Spahn talking about the European leadership in there, because it was the EU which led to pledging for COVID-19. I hope the EU will also have listened to the needs from Florence Sejourné and others, that we now also need to kick off the debate about how can we achieve beyond 2030. And with that, I would like to thank to the companies who have trust in the initiative. I would like to thank all the political leaders who joined us today. And I also would like to thank you, Astrid, for having moderated a fairly complex discussion <laughs> uh, in a fairly warm and humid studio in Berlin. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's true. Thank you so much, Thomas. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers who were joining uh, this uh, event. Thank you very much for your questions and your attention. I think it was a very powerful uh, launch of this uh, initiative, and we have seen there is a very strong will of supporting this initiative and this fund. So. If you want to get more information on the AMR Action Fund, just look on the new homepage. You find everything there and you can follow also on Twitter, on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So thanks again. Have a very nice day and goodbye from Berlin.